Hey all, so we're gonna talk about some basic building blocks of rhetoric today. And rhetoric is essentially the kind of conception that everything's an argument. This idea that texts are created to meet rhetorical situations. Texts is a hard word to say, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that again to make sure that you're clear about that. Um, so a text is created, to use the singular, uh, to meet a rhetorical situation. And then we're gonna talk about from there uh, a little bit more about the rhetorical triangle and how that's used to analyze um, a text for uh, the purposes of, first of all, when you're researching, trying to make sure that something works for what you're gonna do, make sure that it checks all the boxes. And then as you're, as you're reading, as you're consuming information, uh, helps you assess, okay, is this something that I really believe? Is this something that's credible? Is this something that uh, sort of satisfies me as, as a potential audience member or an actual audience member for this. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we, as we go through. So let's go ahead and get with the basics. The idea of a text, it's created by an author, right? So this can be a person or a group of people. Uh, if it's an advertisement, for example, it might be, say, you know, for example, uh, a company, a car company, they work with an ad agency. So the ad agency is actually doing all the creative work, uh, but they sign off on that final messaging. And so they're gonna be the ones that are considered the author for that. And then there's an audience, there's a specific person or group of people in mind. Uh, there might be other kind of audiences along the way that they reach, uh, maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally, but typically you're, as an author, thinking about an audience that is going to consume your message. And then you're trying to achieve a purpose, right? And that's all to meet a rhetorical situation. Um, and a purpose can be to inform, it can be to persuade, um, it can be to excite or energize or inspire. There's a lot of different things it could do. And a rhetorical situation is generally something that an author perceives as a need or something that an audience, audience is expressing that it wants, um, or it can just be something that happens, right? Like let's say there's some mistake that um, the electric company makes and they turn off your power and you need to <laughs> express that they've made a mistake, you're up to date on your bills, they need to turn your power back on, that would be a rhetorical situation, right? So that would be something where you need to meet that with a text. And a text can be, I mean, some of the obvious things are like political speeches, articles, newspapers, opinion pieces, uh, websites, but they can also be films, they can be the clothes you decide to wear on a particular day uh, to communicate certain things. Uh, they can be buildings and public spaces that are intended to make their audience members feel a certain way or be inspired to put in you know, eight hours of work at an office or to enjoy a sports event and to cheer and be really loud and support the home team um, if it's a stadium or an arena. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of conceptions of texts. It's much more than just words on a page, although obviously a lot of your familiarity with text is probably going to be um, the, the words on a page variety. But again, in English and writing studies and all that, we've expanded that kind of idea of what a text is uh, over the, the last period of time. And I think we're better for it. I think it's, I think it's a really useful approach. Uh, so we're gonna get into the three building blocks of what's called the rhetorical triangle. And this was something that Aristotle conceived about 2,500 years ago, uh, studying persuasion, trying to figure out the ways in which people uh, persuade one another. Obviously a very important element of a democracy in Greek city-states. You know, again, he was he was in um, one at the time when he developed this. There's a need to kind of think about how people persuade one another, and so he came up with these concepts. And these concepts are still applicable today. So they're they're terms that you may know because they're pretty commonly taught. Um, but they're also, if you don't know the terminology themselves, you're going to be really familiar with concepts because they're things that you've experienced in the very various messaging that you have been exposed to. So we have ethos. First of all, which is a big kind of broad area that encompasses credibility, authority, and trust. So on a basic level, that can be experts on a particular topic. You know, if you have a newspaper article on medical breakthroughs, you're going to talk to doctors, you're going to talk to researchers, uh, you're going to talk to maybe government officials, people that might have some kind of ideas of whether or not these are actually really medical breakthroughs, whether these are provable, whether these are scientific, um, those sorts of things. Uh, you also might have, you know, for example, um, in court proceedings, you might have a forensics expert, right? You might have somebody who is um, 
able to discern kind of what evidence means. You might bring that person um, and rely on his or her expertise um, to help you make your case. When you're writing papers, you bring sources in oftentimes to add ethos, right? You have people that are learned, people who have credentials, uh, people who publish, people who work in certain fields, who can speak to particular topics that you might be writing about. And that just builds on your credibility as well, right? So you're, you have your own credibility as a student going in and researching, being a scholar, but you also uh, will have a more effective paper if you're bringing in other sources and other people rather than just relying on kind of your own knowledge and your own opinion. So when we do academic writing, that's, that's why we utilize sources in the first place. It's a very ethos sort of based concern. All right, and then next we're gonna have pathos. Oh, one more thing I want to talk about with ethos before we get into pathos. Um, so ethos can also happen not necessarily because somebody is an expert, but just because we have a good feeling about someone. We have a trust based on kind of a relationship that we might have, whether that person is someone we know or someone that we you know, don't know, like an athlete, for example, right? So if you have a famous basketball player like LeBron James and he's advertising basketball shoes, um, that ties directly into what he does on the court. But if he's advertising Samsung products, you know, there's this perception of him as, you know, a good stand-up nice guy as well as an excellent basketball player. Uh, so we might have a sort of connection to him based on that. And so advertisers will rely on that ethos, not based on what he does for a living, but just kind of how we feel about him, you know, as a personality, as a celebrity, that sort of thing. All right, so, uh, and with the San Antonio Spurs, for example, they do a lot of commercials with HEB. Uh, and part of what they do with the trust is they make them, you know, kind of purposefully low budget. So it doesn't look like they're putting on airs. It doesn't look like they're throwing a lot of money at it. Um, HEB is a very kind of humble, hardworking Texas company, lots of principles, does what makes sense. The Spurs are kind of similar as a basketball team. So that's a fit that works really well together. All right, on to pathos. That is emotion, right? So this kind of idea, does it make you laugh? Does it make you weepy? Does it make you angry? Any of those sorts of things. Advertisements will use pathos a lot because obviously uh, if you feel and register those sort sorts of things and then um, have those kind of emotional ties to products, you might be more likely to buy them based on that. Um, again, we are very feeling creatures at our cores as human beings. And so uh, pathos is a way to tap into that. Again, with some audiences, pathos might be more important. Uh, some purposes, it might be more important, right? If you're trying to energize and inspire and you have a bunch of people that are already on your side, like for example, in political campaigns, if you ever sign up for, you know, if you donate money to a candidate, um, you're gonna get a lot of emails from that candidate. A lot of them are gonna be ethos-based. A lot of them are going to be, you know, oh, we feel really great about this candidate or we're really scared about what happens if our candidate doesn't win. And so they'll play upon that and you'll see these kind of obvious appeals uh, to pathos that happens in that. So uh, if you haven't experienced this yet, donate to a candidate and try it. See, see how quickly it happens and see how uh, consistently it happens because I, I can guarantee you that it will happen quite a bit, right? So uh, Logos is the last thing. So this is uh, pertaining to facts and statistics. And um, with this, you might be able to see this a little bit here. Um, some also say logic. I'm kind of iffy on that. I'm much more in the school that logos equals just facts and statistics, employing things that are uh, provable, knowable, measurable um, within your paper. But obviously logos and logic have the same root word. And so some people, when they're doing rhetorical analysis, will extend to whatever the, the author is doing logically to appeal to logic, to appeal to that sort of sense. Um, but essentially it's, it's factual information that you plug into an argument to, to make your point clear. Again, in some cases you won't necessarily need that, uh, but in some cases you will, right? If you're trying to persuade somebody who's on the fence, who doesn't really have a feeling one way or the other about things, uh, then Logos might be something that you would wanna use, right? So obviously, you know, politically we're in an era right now where facts kind of get challenged and um, the messaging, that certain candidates might use or maybe a little bit, you know, fact light or use alternative facts, which are, you know, indeed not really facts, but, um, but they might be presented in ways that they are, right? So again, a lot of this can be uh, perception. And the other thing too is that you can use various kind of statistics and you can kind of bend them and present them in ways that might say one thing or the other too. So that's, that's something that's very important when you're analyzing uh, any sort of text. 
uh, you want to make sure that the facts actually stand up if they're using facts. That's part of how you know uh, whether or not that it's a credible um, argument that is, again, usable, that is worthwhile um, in terms of what you might plug into a paper. All right, so um, basic building blocks of rhetoric, that's going to be really, really important um, all throughout the semester. So offering this to you now early, just make sure that everybody's grounded and has a uh, right idea in terms of, of what that all is. Uh, and it's certainly, these are concepts that we'll be talking about throughout. So um, keep those in mind. All right, thanks.